Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, Dare Fest and our presentation on the updated Russian diet guidelines. My name is Susan Karanoff. I'm co-founder and board member of the Global Dare Foundation, and I'll be your host for today. Joining with me, I have Eleanor Baldwin, who has been advising on the Russian diet since 2003, as well as Sarah Furman, who has been working as a dietitian at the Adult Inherited Metabolic Disorders in the Guys and St. Thomas Foundation in London since 2017. Next slide, please. Uh, before I hand over uh, to, to Eleanor and Sarah, I just want to share a little bit about Global Dare Foundation, as well as provide a few housekeeping details for today. Global Dare Foundation was established in October 2019. Dare stands for Defeat Adult Refsum Everywhere. Our mission is to promote worldwide awareness and better quality of life for all who are diagnosed with Refsum disease. Our goal is to support research, education initiatives, awareness campaigns, and advocacy. Driving research is at the center of what we do because we dare to believe that there is a cure for adult Refsum disease. Both Eleanor and Sarah support Global Dare Foundation's mission by being valuable members of our medical and scientific advisory board. With them and other members of the board, we are raising awareness for Refsum disease, driving better treatment and care, and reinvigorating the research into better therapies for Refsum disease. Now on to a few housekeeping details. Next slide, please. But just for your information, all participants are in listen mode only without video. At any time during the presentation, you can place your questions in the Q&A box in the state section to the right of the screen. It will not be possible to unmute to ask your questions. So please do go ahead and place your questions in the Q&A. Additionally, we're taking a poll to understand how often patients see a dietitian. If you are a patient, please help us by answering the question which can be found under the polls on the stage section on the right-hand side of the screen. After the presentation, I will be moderating the Q&A session. And as well, today's session is being recorded for later viewing on the Global Dare Foundation YouTube channel, as well as our website. Next slide, please, Christy. With that, I'll turn over to Eleanor. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. First slide, please. So I'd like to start off just by looking at what we are trying to achieve with the Refsum's diet. So the first thing we're trying to achieve is a lower plasma phytanic acid concentration. We, don't, we are not um, sure what the ideal target uh, phytanic acid uh, reading should be. Um, but currently, we advise people to try and reach a phytanic acid, a serum phytanic acid level of about two to three hundred. Um, and we do know some people have achieved lower readings than that. Um, the second reason uh, for looking at the Refsum's diet uh, is to try to reduce the progression of the complications of adult Refsum's disease. So the changes in sight, neuropathy and the skin changes. Um, we do know that when people reduce their serum uh, phytanic acid level, uh, that they have improvements in their skin and they have improvements in, in um, sensation in the feet, for example, and the lower limbs. Um, and we also uh, generally find that uh, if people, uh, so it's very difficult to talk about readings, and I'm sure this will be covered um, in other parts, other presentations, but generally, we, we are looking to try and keep the phytanic acid levels definitely below uh, three figures, so definitely below a, a thousand, um, because it's usually at that level that we notice that there are changes in uh, sensation and the skin. Although, of course, everybody is different. The third reason for looking at dietary intake in adult Refsum's disease sufferers is to try to optimize nutritional status. People with adult Refsum's disease have a normal lifespan um, and they often develop other conditions uh, which can be associated with diet, lifestyle and aging, like cardiovascular disease, 
type 2 diabetes and cancer. Next slide, please. So perhaps it's useful uh, to think about what a normal phytanic acid trend is in a person with adult Refsum's disease. I think sometimes when people first learn they have adult Refsum's disease, they perhaps expect that their readings will go downwards once they start on the diet in a continual straight line. Um, and nobody finds that, that that is the case. Um, we would hope that the overall trend in your readings would be to be generally to generally go down. But as you can see uh, from this graph, um, on the uh, on the upwards axis, you have the height of phytanic acid level, um, and then on the x i x axis or the bottom axis, the horizontal axis, you have time. So you can see that each of these individuals with adult Refsum's disease, their overall trend in their readings from diagnosis um, to some years after diagnosis is a gradual downwards trend. But in between, um, they haven't had a straight downwards trend. Their readings have gone up and down. Um, and so that is our expectation, is that your readings will go up and down, but we hope that they will overall proceed on a downward trend. Next slide, please. So why do some people with adult Refsum's disease find it harder to reduce their phytanic acid uh, readings than others? We believe that the type of uh, mutation you have, you know, where in the phytanic acid uh, metabolism pathway, uh, which part of that pathway is affected, will affect um, how easy it is for you to reduce your phytanic acid level. We also um, are aware that different individuals um, are able to process phytanic acid through their secondary oxidation pathway, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later, at different rates. So one individual um, might be better at disposing of phytanic acid uh, through the secondary pathway than another person. Um, and even within a family, there may be individuals who uh, eat exactly the same sorts of things, um, but they, they still find that there are differences uh, between them in their phytanic acid readings. Weight stability seems to be very important. So if you lose weight um, or you find it very hard to keep your weight stable uh, because of depression or illness or a lack of interest in food, um, then that weight fluctuation, particularly a weight decrease, um, can make the phytanic acid level increase. And we also think that some people may be eating foods which are rich in either phytol fatty acid esters or free phytol or phytanic acid through a lack of awareness on our and also your part um, of the amount uh, of these things actually in their food. And it's been a great thing um, to have uh, these extra foods analyzed so that we have more awareness uh, of whether or not um, these foods are contributing to some people's difficulty in reducing their phytanic acid readings. Next slide, please. So which dietary factors affect phytanic acid in the, in the blood? Um, I think you're probably all aware that uh, foods rich in phytanic acid will make the blood phytanic acid level go up. But we also now know that foods rich in free phytol and phytol fatty acid esters can also make the phytanic acid level in the blood go up. As I mentioned earlier, weight loss, illness, surgery or stress can make the uh, serum phytanic acid level go up and as you will and there are separate uh, videos uh, on the global dare website um, and on the darefest site uh, that you can look at um, on these specific topics 
exercise, air, particularly aerobic exercise, um, incre can increase the serum phytanic acid level. And we also, um, from past patients' experience, have noticed that uh, a high intake of stimulants such as caffeine and cannabis uh, can lead to increases in the serum phytanic acid level. Uh, next slide, please. So how do the new diet guidelines differ from the old diet guidelines? The new diet guide takes into account the updated dietary analysis of food sponsored by Global Dare. We hope it will make you to feel more confident in eating a wider range of foods. And we hope that it will also help the people with adult Refsum's disease who've found that their readings don't respond well to the current diet. We've had to make an assumption um, in producing this diet guideline that one milligram of phytanic acid will have the same effect on your serum phytanic acid as free phytol and as phytol fatty acid esters. We don't know that that's the case. It is possible that the absorption of free phytol and phytol fatty acid esters from the gut are not, um, that these things are not quite as well absorbed from the gut as phytanic acid itself is. So that, so it's possible that the diet guidelines will, or it's likely that the diet guidelines will change again. Um, but, but that's the, the premise that we have constructed this diet guideline uh, on that basis, that they that each of these three things will affect your uh, serum phytanic acid, i.e. your blood phytanic acid levels in the same way. If your plasma phytanic acid uh, reading is already well controlled, there is no need for you to cut out the foods or limit the foods that are now on the amber or limit list because your readings are already well controlled. Uh, so please don't feel that you need to suddenly um, remove these things from your diet or reduce these things in your diet if your readings are currently very well controlled. Next slide, please. If you are you know, when you look at the diet guidelines or when you listen to this presentation, it may lead you to think that you should remove from your diet some individual foods or that you should eat less of them. It's really important that if you're thinking about making changes to your diet, um, that you discuss these changes with your dietitian or your healthcare team. And the reason for that is that if you um, reduce your intake of a food that is perhaps now on the limit list that you previously ate a lot of, um, that food may have been a significant source of calories for you. And it may have been a significant source of different vitamins or minerals or protein. So if you take it away, it's possible that, uh, that you may lose weight or that your diet may be nutritionally less balanced. So we would recommend that if you are reducing your intake of some foods um, as a result of this presentation and the new diet guidelines which will be coming out, that you try and swap the foods that you are limiting with foods that are similar um, that are on the, on the green list. Next slide, please. So let's, so before we focus on these new diet, diet guidelines, I'd just like to start with a reminder about metabolism in people with adult Refsum's disease. So we know that people with adult Refsum's disease, because of this genetic mutation, that they have a reduced ability to metabolize or break down this one fatty acid called phytanic acid. We know that this fat only comes from the diet. And we also know that the main breakdown pathway uh, doesn't function 
in people with adult Refsum's disease, but that there is a minor pathway, so a pathway that normally doesn't process much phytanic acid in people who don't have Refsum's disease, um, still works. And how efficient that secondary pathway, or we call it omega oxidation is, seems to vary between people with, with adult Refsum's disease. And that may be, may well be one of the reasons why peop, some people find it harder to reduce their blood phytanic acid reading than others. Next slide, please. So where does phytanic acid come from? We know that phytanic acid in the blood comes from the diet. We know that phytanic acid itself is a breakdown product of chlorophyll. We know it's produced in large amounts by ruminant animals. So that's uh, animals like um, cows, for example. Um, and this means that cows, sheep, goats, their meat and their dairy products are rich sources of phytanic acid. So these are, are facts that we've known for some time. We also know that fish contains phytanic acid and that that phytanic acid comes from algae or from eating other fish that have eaten algae. We do know that small amounts or smaller amounts of phytanic acid occur in other foods, but not all foods have been analyzed. So if a food has not been analyzed, we can only guess how much phytanic acid it may contain. We don't actually know how much phytanic acid that food contains. And that has been the big benefit of this, um, of this funding of, of dietary analysis, um, which we are, are very grateful for. Next slide, please. We also know that there are two other substances that can be converted to phytanic acid. What we don't know is whether or not one milligram of these two substances is converted to one milligram of phytanic acid. Um, because although, although there have been studies look, um, using uh, models or um, sort of models of digestion, that have shown that these things can be converted into phytanic acid. These, um, the models are not people, um, and the research uh, needs to be really done in, in people so that we can have a clearer idea of ex if whether or not free phytol and phytol fatty acid esters um, affect phytanic acid levels in exactly the same way as pure phytanic acid from food. Next slide, please. So what happens when you eat more phytanic acid than your body can metabolize? Any phytanic acid that is not metabolized through your omega oxidation pathway or the secondary oxidation pathway will be stored in any fat containing tissues in your body. So your liver will sub store a substantial amount of phytanic acid. Um, and that's the store of phytanic acid that's released when you're uh, not well uh, or when you start to lose weight. It's also stored in adipose tissue and all other tissues and organs that contain fat. So it will be quite well or widely distributed in the body. We know that weight loss, illness, and exercise can cause this stored phytanic acid to begin to re be released uh, into the blood. And in another presentation, uh, which is, is part of, of this festival, uh, we've discussed uh, how much uh, it, the phytanic acid level can go up, how long this takes to occur, and what you can do to prevent this happening. Next slide, please. And I'm now handing over to Sarah. Thank you, Eleanor. So the next part of the presentation, I will be introducing the new diet guidelines. <clears throat> so prior to, to 2021, 
Um, the diet guidelines have had multiple different versions and the aim of all the guides have been to avoid high foods that are high in phytanic acid. So that is any food that has a phytanic acid of more than 10 milligrams per 100 grams. So the guidelines have predominantly focused and co concentrated on avoiding these high foods and more recently introduction introducing restrictions around foods that we have found to be high in phytol and phytal fatty esters such as rocket or peppers olives which are foods that were introduced in the last version of the diet guide and as Eleanor said, um, Global Dare has funded the analysis of over 60 foods over the last year, which has contributed a wealth of knowledge to the database that we already have on various different foods that have been analysed. We've put the data from the last year and collated that with previous published food analysis, um, which has led us to be able to develop a traffic light guide for the new diet guidelines that are released this year. Next slide, please. So introducing the new traffic light system, and this system will be um, clearly laid out in the diet guide that will be um, available online. And foods have now been categorized into three sections, a go, a caution and a stop. So the GO section are foods that have been found to contain very small amounts of phytanic acid, phytal esters, or free phytols, and so therefore can be eaten freely. The categories, as I speak through them, are based off our, our knowledge that we have to date about omega oxidation, which is the pathway that Eleanor spoke about that is still able to process small amounts of phytanic acid. So foods that are very low um, have been chosen, have been specified as being able to eat freely because they contain very small amounts of these um, compounds and therefore the body should be able to process small amounts. The caution section are for foods that need to be limited to a total of a hundred gram portion of either one of the food or any combination of the foods once a day. And these are foods that contain moderate amounts of phytanic acid phytol fatty esters or free phytols. And the last category, the avoid or the stop section, are foods that do need to be avoided as they are very high in phytanic acid, phytol esters and free phytols. Next slide, please. So how do we go about categorizing foods into these different traffic lights? We've collated all the previous and the new food analysis on phyt phytanic acid, free phytols, and phytal esters. The, all the foods that were analyzed by Global Dare in the recent analysis had, has information on all these products. We then also, we compared across all the different um, food analysis conducted over the years, some back, back in 1990 up to the more recent ones done this year and last year. And from that, we <clears throat> categorized foods into the different traffic lights. For some foods, they had never been analysed <clears throat> and therefore this year was the first um, time that this, we had a figure for the phy phytanic acid or the free phytols or phytal esters of a food. Where other foods, there was analysis that had been completed across multiple different um, time points. At the bottom, I've included an example of this, which is peanuts. And as you can see, for some foods, and as is the case for peanuts, there is quite a large variation in the values. Some analysis um, done quite a few years ago found peanuts to be very high. <clears throat> you can see the figures, it's very small on the screen, but sitting around the 40 milligrams per 100 grams. And then, and then we have more recent analysis showing peanuts to be lower in phytanic acid and another analysis showing it to be moderate. So for this diet guide, we have taken a conservative approach where there is foods with big, big significant variations. We have gone for the one that would categorize it as the safest food option because we are aware that people's portion sizes um, and frequency that they might eat a certain food can vary. So for example, for peanuts, they would sit in the, sorry, do you mind clicking once more? 
they would sit in the stop section to be avoided based on the information we have showing that there has been previously quite high phytanic acid levels. Next slide, please. Here is just a quick um, snip of what the greens go section might look like. We've tried to, we have categorized the foods into um, different food categories. We've got meat and eggs, seafood, vegetables, fruits, legumes, for example. This isn't the whole of the list. Um, this is just a portion of it, but there's lots of new foods that have now at, been added to the go list, which is really exciting because hopefully it can give more confidence in um, the variety of foods that can be chosen that are low in phytanic acid in the phytol esters and the free phytols. Next slide, please. I'm now going to talk a little bit about some of the foods that have had quite a significant change with the updated guideline. The caution section, which I've got on the screen, again, it's a, it's a portion of the list. It's not the full list. And just going back to what caution means, these are foods that can be consumed, but need to be consumed in limited amounts or in moderation. So a 100 gram portion of one or any combination of these foods a day. As you will see on the screen, um, pork and ham have moved into the caution or the amber section. Um, and this is a food that I know is very frequently consumed by a lot of people with adult Rafson's disease. There's been a lot of discussion about this product and we just wanted to put some information to why this has moved into this section. So down the bottom, and again, I apologize for the small numbers. I've just snap, put a, a snip of the data that's come from our database. Um, and as you can see that pork um, in previous analysis has contained up to 3.8 or four milligrams per 100 grams of that product and ham just over five milligrams per 100 grams. If we, from our knowledge at this time about omega oxidation, it's thought that the body can process around 10 milligrams of phytanic acid a day. So with a 100 gram portion of pork, more likely more a, a larger portion, that can contribute a significant amount, amount of phytanic acid to the day. And I've included a picture on the screen of what a 60 gram portion of pork would look like and what a 120 gram portion could look like. So it's very easy to consume more than 100 grams of pork a day, maybe at one meal, maybe at a, more, um, a couple of meals. And therefore it could be something that may contribute to higher levels. We've put it on the amber list. Um, so it is still a product that can be consumed. And um, if kept to 100, um, 100 gram portion a day. Um, but if someone, if you are struggling with your phytanic acid level um, and they're not responding to the change, or it's a food that you, if you've got high phytanic acid levels and it's a food that you consume a lot, it might be one just to maybe have a discussion with your dietitian or your healthcare provider about um, and looking at it in the context of maybe some other protein foods. Next slide, please. The recent analysis um, has also given some inf new information that we didn't previously have about legumes. <clears throat> and there is a section of legumes that are, have fitted into the green um, category that can be eaten freely. I've just highlighted here, um, and I, again, I've included a, a picture of um, the data that we have showing that um, edamame beans and chickpeas are very low in phytanic acid, but actually phytol esters, they contain moderate amounts of phytol esters. And so they are legumes that have that may sometimes feature in some people's diet and they have come onto the caution section. So one to consume in moderation and if levels are high to maybe be cautious about how often you are consuming those foods. Next slide, please. And Lastly, another, another change we just want to mention is it's quite a significant change from the previous analysis. So historically, um, analysis had found haddock and cod to be lower in phytanic acid. Um, but in the more recent analysis, we have found that the um, phytanic acid levels that have come back for haddock and cod are high. So they are above the five milligrams per 100 grams a day. And so they have switched onto the avoid list and one to be a bit more cautious with. 
Do you mind clicking through? Sorry, there's a few more. Thank you. Perfect. The diet guide um, will be published and made available on Global Dare, and that really was just a, a little snippet of some of the things we've included. I've discussed some of the major changes, um, but it will really highlight um, in the full diet sheet, hopefully, a greater variety of options that fit under green, ones to maybe be a little bit more cautious or think about if levels are high, and ones to continue avoid, to avoid, most of which you are very familiar with. I've just included some slides about some of the key macronutrients because protein is a really important nutrient for growth, development, and um, keeping muscles healthy and strong. A lot of foods that we talk about when it comes to phytanic acid are animal-based proteins. And so it's really important to find options for, for you that you can take every day as part of meals. Um, to ensure you're getting enough protein and also um, protein has a really important role in, in feeling full or satisfied. So on our green list, and I've just included a few in each category, there is a lot more on there. Um, under the go section, some of the protein foods that can be included are chicken, eggs, duck, tofu, so corn, tofu, a lot of the vegan products um, have come back very low in, um, in phytanic acid, uh, red kidney beans, and um, fat-free milk. The cautious section um, are things such as the pork and the ham that we've talked about. Prawns have also come up um, based on the analysis of um, as, as a cautious food. Uh, tuna in water or brine and chickpeas. So again, these are foods that may be able to feature as part of the day, but in a set or a moderate portion. And then in the avoid list, foods that are found to be very high in phytanic acid, are the beef, lamb, goat, foods that you are familiar with. Um, the prosciutto is one to be um, wary of. So because it's a dry version of the pork, it's a lot more concentrated. It's had the, the moisture and water removed. And so that does actually have an even higher phytanic acid um, got that value per 100 grams. The oily fish, such as salmon, the cod and the haddock that I have mentioned, and um, the full fat dairy or cheese that are very high in phytanic acid. So these ones do need to be avoided, um, but ensuring that you've got options that you can enjoy and that do provide a source of protein is really important throughout the day at each meal. Next slide. When it comes to carbohydrates, which are another very important um, macronutrient on the plate, majority fit into the, the go section. So your pasta, rice, um, potatoes, cereals, breads, um, couscous, tapioca, they, they fit into the go section. The ones to be careful of are really um, any cereals that contain dairy. So as long as they are dairy free, they don't contain butter, um, milks, then they are okay to have. Um, so it's important to check the label. Next slide, please. I just would thought I would mention here, and you may already have seen it. So part of the Dare Fest um, is a pre-recording on label reading. So what to look out for when reading a label with adult refsims. So do have it, do check out the pre-recorded video if you've got some, if you would like some more information on this. Um, it's a very, it's a complicated minefield navigating labels, but will hopefully give some key um, items and ingredients to look out for when trying to determine if a food is safe to have. Next slide, please. Fruits and vegetables. So the most recent analysis included an extensive list of fruits and vegetables, and um, it is confirmed that all fruits and vegetables, fresh or dried, are are good to have every day freely. So they fit, all fit under the go section. Next slide, please. And for vegetables, um, we have, they've highlighted again that most vegetables sit under the go section. There's been quite a list again, analyzed and they're all listed on the new diet sheet. There continues to be a couple, a handful of vegetables under the caution section. Um, rocket and peppers are ones that you uh, may be familiar from the last diet guide because of um, the phytal ester content. Um, olives still remain on there, but we've recently added broccoli and spinach. So they have also come up as having moderate amounts of these 
um, containing these products. So they need to be consumed in moderation. Under the stop category, kale in the recent analysis has come out as very high. And so therefore we would recommend avoiding that vegetable. Next slide, please. So I thought I'd just finished um, with my plate. So this is, this is a healthy, balanced eating plate, which applies to anyone, whether you've got adult Raphson's disease or not. Um, so we've talked about protein, we've talked about carbohydrates, and we've talked about vegetables, and we've talked about them in the context of adult Raphson's and the um, phytanic acid, phytol, and phytol ester content. But it's important to make sure that your plate is balanced and that you are getting all the nutrients that you need from the different macronutrients and micronutrients. So for the healthy eating plate, we would recommend that a third of the plate or a hand size portion, it's quite a good guide, um, which should come from protein foods. Uh, and that would be back to the slide I mentioned previously, finding ones that are either in the green section that could be eaten daily or in the moderate um, caution section in 100 gram portion. So aiming to have one of those protein foods on your plate at each meal. Another third of your plate is dedicated to carbohydrates. And again, your fist I put there is a really good guide on what that might be because plates can vary quite a lot in, in the size. Um, so carbohydrates are really important. They provide um, lots of vitamins, minerals, fiber, and they also are break down to glucose, which is the predominant fuel that your body uses. And in our last um, webinar last year, we talked a lot about um, the importance of regular meals, carbohydrates, and that also comes into when we're talking about exercise. So carbohydrates are a really key part of a meal for adult Raphsims. And um, as I mentioned in the slide earlier, most carbohydrates uh, fit into the go section. So it's important to include um, a portion of carbohydrates such as rice, pasta, potatoes, bread, um, grains, cereals. And these can definitely come from high fiber sources. Um, that's definitely would be recommended. They're a slow release carbohydrate. And if you might have other um, comorbidities such as diabetes, um, keeping carbohydrates down to that recommended fist serve or a, quarter, a third of the plate and going for more high fiber, slow release carbohydrates is recommended. And the last third plate is dedicated to vegetables, salads, and maybe even a, a portion of fruit um, that would fit onto the plate and using the big variety of options that are available on the go section for those foods. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the updated guideline will be made available on the Global Dare website in the next month. So the full guide will be up, uploaded and the, diet, the website will be updated to feature all the new dietary information. It is a general guide, um, so it doesn't have individualized advice. Um, we know that everyone's phytanic acid levels are different. Um, food portions are different and the frequency that people might consume foods and food preferences change. So it's important to consult with your dietitian and your health team to allow a more individualized advice, but using the guide as a general um, outline. We do um, encourage the dietitians and health teams to contact um, us for guidance. If there's any questions from the diet guide or want to talk more specifically on an individualized case, um, we are here to offer that guidance and support. As Eleanor said, the diet guide will continue to change and will evolve as we learn more about food and more about adult Raphsims. There is more research to come. There's more food analysis to be done. Um, so we will be updating you and keeping you formed as it evolves. Your experience is really helpful to guide the diet. Um, we, a lot of our dietary information is driven by the, the food analysis that we have, but also our experience um, of the, our patients with adult Raphsims and how their levels respond to different food and diet patterns. So please give your feedback to either your health team or to Global Dare um, as you um, make some of the dietary changes and um, read through the new diet guidelines. This feedback is really, really valuable um, for as we go forward in developing the information further. Next slide, please. And that brings us to the end of our presentation.
Thank you for listening. And I will um, hand it back to Susan for uh, questions and answers. Thank you very much, Sarah and, and Eleanor. That was uh, a great presentation, very informative, very in insightful. And it's also very exciting to see that there are now a, a number of foods that we're able to eat and that opens up more possibilities for us as, as uh, reference patients. And as you said, um, there's more testing to come. The DARE Foundation will be funding the testing of uh, approximately uh, 30 more items this year. So we'll be um, able to continue updating the diet guidelines um, probably by, by the end of the year or already next year. Um, I just want to remind everybody who's participating as a patient uh, to please answer the poll question. As I said, you can find it to the right hand side of the screen under the stage section. I don't see too many questions in the Q&A. Um, one has just popped up, um, but I also have some questions that we've collected in advance and I have some additional questions. So uh, we'll start off. Um, there's a question about olive oil. What about olive oil? Okay. Look. Sarah, do you want to take that one? Yep, yep. Um, so oils are something that um, we had a first round of testing last year, and um, I believe there's going to be a repeat on the oils. So we are waiting for repeat analysis. Um, from the initial first line, olive oil looked to be fine. Um, it, we are aware that olives themselves do have phytoesters, and so they are on the caution section. Um, but they are, an, they are a food that you have to eat a lot of olives to have an impact. So if using olive oil as we normally would, um, as, you, as you, most people would tend to, dressing on a salad or a small amount in cooking would be absolutely fine. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Sarah, since, um, since the guidelines have been um, released, um, we've had some questions about losing weight. Um, this, this is something that, that comes up again and again. And the general guidance has been, if your values are, I don't know, somewhere between two or 300, then you know, you're know you okay to lose weight at a very slow rate. But what about somebody who is, um, whose levels may be hovering between, I don't know, bouncing up and down between 400 and 800? Is it at all possible to lose weight at, at this level? Do you want to take this one, Eleanor? Yes, it can do. Um, it's a very difficult question. Um, we know that there is a large pool of phytanic acid normally stored in the liver of an individual. So if you diet very strictly, you know, if you cut down on your food intake a lot, if you were to follow a very low calorie diet, for example, we know that a lot of phytanic acid could potentially be released from the liver. So anybody who um, follows a weight reducing diet, we would definitely say that it shouldn't be a really strict, very low calorie diet. It would have to be a, a, a gradual weight reduction diet. We do know quite a lot of people with adult Refson's disease have other morbidities. So they perhaps have type two diabetes, uh, or they may have mobility issues, and being overweight doesn't help uh, with, either, with either of those problems. So if your levels were between four and 800, um, then I think we would recommend discussing with your physician uh, whether or not weight loss would be advised for you but we could certainly imagine that there would be some circumstances in which people would want um, and that it would be okay to gradually reduce weight. Um, but it, the emphasis would have to be on, on gradual. So for example, if you had somebody with type two diabetes who had high blood glucose levels and they were looking at needing to add in additional medications or the other option was to try to lose a little bit of weight and their phytanic acid level was maybe 400 and stable, then that person, you would argue that a, a gradual weight reduction would be beneficial. Whereas if it was somebody whose 
phytanic acid levels bounce up between six and eight hundred and they're sometimes higher than that or they quite often go higher than that they're sort of more variable and they don't have another comorbidity they don't have diabetes or they're not particularly overweight then that person we might say it would be better to to uh, to wait until their readings were a little bit more stable and a bit lower do you agree with that sarah yep uh, yeah okay. i do i do and i think close a bit more um maybe seeing if the team can offer closer monitoring if you are losing weight can be helpful just to keep a close eye on the impact on the phytanic acid levels mm -hmm. Can I also mention, sorry, if you are trying to lose weight, um, then it, it, you know, there are other things that remain important because often when people are trying to lose weight, they also are trying to increase their exercise. So you can see that if you are trying to lose weight, there might be two things that potentially would increase your phytanic acid level. So we would really recommend cautiously making changes so you might look at increasing your physical activity levels which we know perhaps in we know in type 2 diabetes that increasing physical activity can be beneficial because it improves insulin sensitivity but again we would also recommend that if you were looking at increasing your physical activity that you would need to um look at the guidance that we've we've put on on the video so you might want to make stepwise changes you might want to look at your physical activity levels first and then look at diet rather than trying to do both things at once does that make sense does yeah. do you agree yeah it, it it's just very difficult i know and so frustrating um when you're trying to do something to that you know will improve your health it's just that it may not improve your Refsum's disease. Um, and, and that may be the thing that is most, is most significant for you as an individual. It really depends on you as an individual um, and how your symptoms of Refsum's disease, I think, are. Yeah, yeah. But in any case, I think somebody who's attempting to lose weight definitely needs to do it in consultation with a dietitian and, and their physician. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. And if somebody were eating foods that are high in phytanic acid, would the phytanic acid uh, show up in a blood level, or, or and or um, will it get shunted into the stores in the body? So, like, what what percentage of the phytanic acid that's in the body actually goes into the stores? And we know that you know, potentially there it's doing damage as well. Uh, the short answer, I think, is we don't know the answer to that. Um, we would, if you were gaining weight, then we would expect um, that that perhaps a, a slightly more would go into the fat stores. But we don't actually actually know the answer to that that question. Um, it's a very difficult one. In the past, there have been studies where we've looked. This is a different answer to your question, where we've looked at fat biopsies. So people have had fat biopsies to see how much phytanic acid was in their fat stores. And it may be that people have different amounts of phytanic acid in different fat stores. We don't know the answer to that either. Um, and we've looked at the serum phytanic acid and the, fat, the adipose tissue stores at the same time. Um, so we, we, we do, um, there is some data on that, but it, not enough to give any, any guidance or, or figures or numbers about it. Another way of thinking about it is some people in the past have had phytanic acid levels that are very close to zero in their blood. Um, and their fat, their adipose tissue, has still had a bit of phytanic acid in. So we think the fat stores empty a little bit more slowly because the fat stores don't stay. The adipose tissue you've got today is not the adipose tissue that you had three weeks ago. It gradually changes. Um, and we don't know much about that either. Right, right. Sorry. I, I, 
I, I, I do remember the first Refsum patient that I ever um, got to know after I was diagnosed was a gentleman in the UK. And I was very impressed by the fact that his titanic acid levels were uh, close to zero. Um, it's something that I always aspired to since then and have never gotten anywhere close to it. So it's interesting to see the variability and yet, you know, there's still progression of symptoms. But I guess that goes beyond this discussion. Um, I would like to maybe ask a question to Sarah with regards to um, vegan products that are widely available now on the market. Um, especially as we see that, you know, we should maybe be cutting back on our consumption of ham and various presentations of ham. We'll be looking for alternative uh, sources of, of protein. What's your thought about the, the vegan products that are out there that are, you know, mainly nut-based? So there, there definitely has been a massive rise in vegan products um, available. And while we hope to do further analysis of some of the foods we from the analysis that has been done our understanding is that soya based or tofu products um, and corn products um, corn being q u o r n um, rather than sweet corn are uh, have been found um, to to be low and so i think using these products as part of a of a diet um, is really useful they have a really important role um, we also have found in the recent analysis that coconut has come back as low and coconut does form a lot of the basis for a lot of vegan products. Um, so we, that was a question mark that we had for some time. I know a lot of the vegan dairy alternatives are made from coconut, um, but that has come back in the most recent analysis as low. So that's, I suppose, reassuring that those dairy options are available. Um, dairy alternatives are available. Then there are also vegan products that come from nuts, as, as you mentioned. Um, and nuts, are, the nuts analysis is also new. That's from the recent analysis. We don't have a lot of data from previous analysis besides peanuts, almonds, and Brazil nuts, which have been previously shown to be high. And so therefore we put them cautiously on the, on the red list. But others have come back as... Um, as low and so i think so including products that do incorporate these um from our information knowledge that we have so far is okay um but i think it's important to keep a variety i think when it comes to vegan products i think using some that maybe sit under tofu corn some that sit under nuts and some that are using the dairy alternatives um, are important one for variety but also just bringing food in from different sources as well um, one thing to mention too, just on the vegan products, is that some of the dairy can be a lot lower in calories. Um, so it's just, again, where if you are switching out a product, is just being aware of, of the calorie content that you might be getting from that product and that you are still getting enough nutrients to keep weight stable. Um, so those would be my comments around the vegan foods. Eleanor, I don't know if you have anything more to add to that. Yeah, thanks. I would also add um, that the coconut-based vegan cheeses are not a good source of protein or a good source of calcium. Um, so they're not really nutrient equivalent. They're more something that you would have just to give you um, a broader variety of flavors. Also, if you are swapping something like ham or pork um, for something like tofu or corn, then you, often the energy value is lower in uh, tofu or corn. So you, you would need to find other ways to increase your energy intake because they're not equivalent. So if you were an individual perhaps who maybe has um, ham or pork twice a day and your phytanic acid levels have been high and you're thinking about reducing your pork intake to try to reduce your phytanic acid levels, um, then you might just want to aim for 100 grams of pork, but then swap the other portion that you normally have for something else. But just have a little think, is this thing that I'm swapping in instead a lot lower in calories? Because if it is, you'd want to then add in some other source of calories. Um, okay, so I don't, I don't think I'd add anything else. <laughs> Okay, uh, so a question has come in in the in the chat um, about pork and ham. Um, 
basically uh, it's around the, the level of phytanic acid is going to be very dependent on how the animal is fed in terms of whether it's grass fed or otherwise fed. Can you comment on that? It's really difficult to comment on that because that information is not published uh, with the with the piece of meat that you buy um, it you know it, 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 whether something is um, it, pigs are not normally just grass fed they're f fed a variety of, of things um, so I think it's really difficult to you know to, to generalize and that's why we think the readings uh, in the analysis of food are are, are varied um, and they will be subject to change because farmers will feed pork different things depending on the costs of the foods that they are feeding the animal. Um, and not all of the, of the feed sources have been analysed either. So it's quite difficult to make a general comment on that. Is there something you would add, Sarah, to comment on the pork? No, I think that covers it. It's, it's just, it is really tricky. And farming practices do change levels. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sort of on that note, one of the uh, discussions that we've had within our Facebook community is organic versus non-organic foods. And I think that's something that's now highlighted in the diet guideline that the non-organic products are going to have lower phytanic acid content than the organic, correct? It depends on the food, really. If it's beef, for example, which, you know, is on the avoid list anyway, but it's a good example. Organically fed uh, beef is often grass fed um, and has a higher, much higher phytanic acid level than uh, grain fed beef. Um, but the, it's still on the on the high level. We don't know um, whether or not an organic vegetable that's on the high list is higher than a non-organic one because we haven't got enough information to make that general comment do you agree sarah yeah i think it's we we don't know when it comes to um fruits and vegetables or even grains um and i think with the with the animal-based proteins we've definitely seen it as you say with the beef um and we haven't done an extensive enough analysis to necessarily know if that supplies across all the different animal proteins. Um, so it is, yeah, it's a tricky, <laughs> it's a tricky one. I mean, maybe when it comes to animal proteins, maybe cautious would be to go non-organic. But I think when it comes to vegetables and fruits and grains, I wouldn't know if one or the other really. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So if somebody were conscientious about eating, let's say, organic-based um, vegetables, um, that, that would be fine. There's no preference one or the other, just because we don't know. Yeah, we don't, we don't know. I mean, organic um, vegetable raising um, farming is more to do with, the, with not using pesticides. Yeah. Or, um, yeah rather than anything else and we wouldn't expect that to have any effect on uh, on on the on the vegetable right um in terms of its phytanic acid content but we don't we don't know yeah uh unfortunately a lot of unknowns still within the whole realm of uh, yeah yeah some disease but um we're, we're making progress in uh, you know, getting better insights into it all. Um, what about vitamin supplements? Do you recommend vitamin supplements for adult restaurant patients? We so. did do, sorry, we did do a study um, maybe about five years ago uh, looking at uh, vitamin and mineral uh, levels in the blood of a section of a cross section of people with adult Refson's disease. Um, and we looked at their dietary intake of these substances and also their blood levels. Um, and we found that some patients did have deficiencies in some vitamins and minerals, and that didn't necessarily correlate with their intake. And in a way, we would expect that because um, 
we know that for any for any person, whether they have adult Refsum's disease or not, their requ individual requirement for a nutrient, if you take, say, iron, um, may be different from another person's. And we normally describe this as a standard distribution curve. So um, the recommended daily amount or the, the DRV um, or the recommended daily intake level on vitamins and minerals is normally set at the upper end of people's likely requirement. Um, so we do recommend that people with adult Refsum's disease are screened for vitamin and mineral deficiencies periodically. Um, and when you have your diet review, if your diet review with your dietitian, if you have access to a dietitian, if that dietitian recommends supplements uh, based on your dietary intake, then we would recommend that. But I don't think we have a global recommendation to take a vitamin and mineral supplement. Um, it's more on an individual basis. Sarah, would you agree? Yes, yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, another food-related question. So if we want to comply with, with the diet and we want to avoid dairy products, for instance, is it still safe to um, eat something that may be soaked in milk or um, battered or has a, you know, put in a batter with some milk in it? Is that going to be detrimental to us or is it, would you recommend that's okay occasionally? So, do you, want me, do you want me to start on that one? Oh, no. I'm very got happy for you too. If you want to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, the one, one thing from the new diet guide is that the reanalysis of um, fat free milk has come back very low in phytanic acid. So, previously we did have a, a portion, a, a recommended amount to limit um, milk to, or, or um, fat free milk to, but that now has come into the free section. So, I think it depends on um, the choice of dairy used um, to soak or batter a food in. If it was using the, um, the fat-free version, that would absolutely be fine. I would be a bit more wary if, um, now I can't even think of maybe a food example this would be, but if it was, say, had some cream mixed into the batter, for example, that will come with a lot of phytanic acid. Um, so while it might just be a small coating on the outside, I I think that it would really depend on the type of, of dairy that is used um, to coat that product. Um, if it's something that's used to soak in, in um, a, a dairy, like a milk, for example, there will be, depending again on the food and how porous it is and how much it takes up, there is a chance that it could take up a portion, a good portion of the food that it's, well, of the soaking milk. Um, in which case I would I would definitely stick to it being a fat-free milk um, as as the option rather than a full fat or creamed because there is a chance that that food will take that product up. And I don't know if I've completely answered the question, but Elna, I'll pass it to you if you've got any thoughts on that. <laughs> it's a very difficult one because we do also don't know how much batter sticks to the food and it really depends on the individual food because some foods take a lot more batter than others. Um, I seem to remember going to some restaurants in a country which I will not mention just now um, where fish and chips was on the menu and the fish was probably about the size of a fish finger but the batter was about <laughs> a ruler size long. It was about 12 inches long so I thought I was going to be eating this enormous fish but I wasn't and that means there's a lot of batter there. Mm. Um, so it's sort of, there are lots of variables. It's actually not a straightforward question. I should also mention, though, just about vitamins. I forgot to mention that we do recommend vitamin D during the win winter months, but that's recommended for everybody. Uh, an over-the-counter vitamin D supplement because it's a pro-hormone as well as being important for your muscles. And certainly in the UK, we don't get enough sun. Um, to have a good vitamin D status, certainly not October to April. Um, so, okay. Well, thank you very much for those uh, very informative answers.
Um, I think you've done an excellent job, you know, answering on the fly. Um, you know, as we've seen, there's not answers to everything, and a lot of the times it really depends on different variables, so it's not straightforward. And I think this is just an added level of um, difficulty for a residence patient, and you know, trying to eat properly to you know optimize their 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 diet, but. And with this new diet guidelines, we do have more information, and that is tremendously beneficial. We hope so. Yeah. And I think, as we mentioned at the end of the presentation, so I was just going to say, please do share your experiences um, of of the diet guide um, to to Global Dare, to us, to your health professionals. Um, we all want to learn together as this evolves. Yeah. Okay, well, Eleanor and Sarah, thank you very much for your presentation and your time for us today. And thank you to all of our online participants. It was great having you with us. As I said, this will be available as a recording. And um, yeah, nothing else to say other than I wish you all a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.